What's going on, everybody? Welcome to another episode of Bogey Proof. We are here tonight to recap the dominant victory by the United States at the Ryder Cup this past weekend at Whistling Straits. Uh, joining us tonight, we have myself, Mikey, and Eric, and potentially Joey hopping on later. We never know. Um, but first of all, let's start off with uh, you know what we're sipping on and where we're calling in from. Mikey, what do you got? Yeah, no, no booze tonight. Sorry, guys, hand up on that. But we have a nice... Full body, multi cup of Irish breakfast tea here um, in a nice Guinness mug. So just just going all the way. Not too much caffeine, but just a little bit to get a few get a few things done after this uh, recording here on Tuesday evening. Uh, yeah, just enjoy. It. It's nice and warm. It's fall. You know, nothing like a cup of tea. What do you got, Eric, down there? So last week I was complaining that I couldn't drink anything that was fall yet because it was still 90 fucking degrees. Well, today it was like 75 degrees, so I'm I'm all in back on the, the fall drinks. I am drinking an old-fashioned. Uh, wild Turkey Long Branch is the bourbon of choice, and just a simple old-fashioned. Matthew? Sure. Um, we kind of flip-flopped here, Eric, I'm not going to lie, because I actually took your inspiration made a little tequila soda. Had a, <laughs> we had a little, uh, had like... Just a little bit of Terramano left on the, one of the bottles. On, I was going to make a vodka soda, but that bottle wasn't open yet. Terramano was already open. I was like, nah, let's just take a little more tequila and soda. So ripping a little one of those tonight just to, you know, mix it up. It's rainy and gross here, but, you know, trying to switch the vibes with a little tequila soda. Give me give me some energy tonight to, uh, you know, square away a couple more things at work after this. But without further ado let's yes. dive into it the united states put on a clinic at whistling straits this weekend um i don't know I, i'm sure there's lots we want to get through here but what is your guys biggest takeaway what was your maybe biggest surprise or shocker moment whether in a good or bad way that you did not expect to see this weekend outside of just like i guess the gap in victory i mean i think we all felt pretty good about the united states but i don't know if we, any of us predicted 19 to 9 um Eric, what, yeah, you, what was your biggest but, takeaway? Or Mikey? Hey, guys, before we get started, I just, you know, I was not on last week, but I listened to the podcast, and Joey needs to be, like, put on a plane <laughs> and shipped across the fucking ocean, because he that, guy was, more wrong. <laughs> that guy was so on the European side, I was ready to trade him for, you know, a couple of bottles of bubbly from France, and you know what? We were having at the end of the, the end of the week. So I, I held it back, but I really wanted to get on the story and call him out because that was just an egregious mistake on his end. And just honestly, that type of hate speech has no place on this podcast. So I'm glad that we, I'm glad, you know, that the European team struggled a little bit just to, to put that into Joey's face, but sorry, Matt, I did not, I did not mean to blow it up there, but please. Please restate the question, and we will we'll get back on track. <laughs> That's what we need. We cannot be letting Joey get off the hook. We need to hold him accountable in every aspect because that was, like you said, egregious. Uh, I don't want to go with abuse of power because I don't know if he had any power in making that decision, but lack of patriotism will call him out on. That's for damn sure. So, Eric, what was your biggest takeaway, shocker, surprising factor that went on this weekend at Whistling Straits? I think my biggest takeaway was – how off I was on my prediction of Scotty Scheffler's singles match. Um, I predicted him to win five and four and he only won four and three. Um, <laughs> but so that was a tough one to swallow. Um, but yeah, the biggest takeaway was I can't wait for 2023. I think that like everyone has said, a, a page has been turned in U S golf. And um, as a, as a U.S. golf fan, I, you can't not be excited for what's to come after after what happened this weekend. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's probably a common takeaway that that most people have, but um, definitely the biggest one for me is just excitement. I mean, it was yeah. there. There never really was a moment of of sweat or or nervousness after really like the first nine holes on Friday. Um, and yeah, it's gonna be it's gonna be fun to see see what what can happen in the years to come with this, this young crop of, of U S players. Agreed. It was impressive, pretty thorough beginning to start. I mean, beginning to end, it's like, you know, we've, we've always kind of done really well in that first session and I was like, all right, 
let's not get too ahead of ourselves here, but that, like, that was really easy almost. Like, John Robbs just wasn't going to be beat last week. Like, that he's clearly the best player in the world and, like, was fucking making everything. Like, anytime Sergio didn't put him in a bunker, it was a birdie for their for when they were playing foursomes. Like, it was a clinic that he put on. So, like, let's make sure we give him credit because he is by far and away the best player in the world. It's crazy. But um, outside of that, I mean, nobody really, like, until – Saturday morning like it wasn't too difficult I mean Victor Hovland played pretty well but he just didn't have much help in any of his matches but it was like when that second session went on and the Tony Fina Harris English Bryce and Scotty kind of brought that energy right back in to kind of maintain I feel like we always get so jacked up and get off that head start and then just kind of fall flat I think it was just huge to get that second wave to just bring the energy back to keep us going and like not have us fall behind on the momentum aspect of it. <laughs> <And> <laughs> Joey is on. <laughs> Welcome, Joey. You you made perfect time. We were just getting into the first segment. Appreciate you hopping on and just crushing a uh, quick little makers there for the for the people. Um, <laughs> um, and you know, first segment was your biggest takeaway. We actually did just finish kind of lashing you for your take of Europe's going to kill us last week. So do you have any, do you have any comments? Do you have any comments? Okay. All right. Appreciate you owning that. Thank you. For the highest score since it's been what, 28 points. Um, but I mean, like on Sunday, you want to see some type of competition, like some excitement and they're just, yeah. To me, there was, and then like after you win the cup, I was just watching. I was just like, "All right, I'm bored. Like, yeah. I'm ready for this shit to kind of be done with." But it was awesome. Joey, I mean, yeah. it was fantastic. You know, I love seeing Brooks and Bryson hug it out, and <laughs> these guys being dudes at the end of the day, and it was fantastic. And I, you know, DJ was hammered. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's, it's, it's exciting to see what the future Ryder Cups hold for us now. You know, because like. I agree. Like you were saying, like all those guys, they're old on your team Europe, and it's just like, where are they going to go from from here? So I, you know, I think we have a dominant streak ahead of us. I agree. I agree. Yeah. But I appreciate you owning that because that was that was something to be discussed. We wanted to make sure we addressed that head on. And oh, hundred percent. Would it be a man? Let's go. Um, but <laughs> Joey, I mean, you like, see that, Joey? See, yeah, of course I did. Um, <laughs> so like. The thing it was, though, like, like, my biggest thing was I felt like that golf course kind of fit a little bit of the European style. And, I mean, to this day, you show me a picture of whistling straights without the context, you know, maybe before this weekend, this past weekend. I mean, yeah. I'm telling you that course is in Europe 10 out of 10 times. Like, Yeah. You know well, I mean, Joey, just... I Joey, I don't know if you heard before, but, like, leading up to it, so Herb Kohler, who owns, you know, the whole American club and whistling straights and all that, he told Die, I want an American version of Valley Bunyan, right? And so yeah. for our listeners out there, that was one of the places that's, that Matt and I had an opportunity to play when we were in Ireland. So be ready for, uh, for that course review to, to hit the Instagram tomorrow on Wednesday. Um, and you will see quite a bit of kind of those similar features. Mm -hmm. But I think visually is kind of where it ends, at yeah. least from what I saw. And like what I experienced when I was over there, it just you, from an aerial game and JT and Spieth talked about it earlier in the week. It is an aerial links and mm -hmm. to get to some of these pins and to use the slopes appropriately, you had to kind of land it on top of things and bring it in. Like, yes, they were working the ball, but outside of that three wood that DJ hit on 16 kind of down the stretch, not many balls were like ran onto the, the green a ton. Yeah. Really, you you know, kind of had to land on the green. And even, like, I think back on that first hole, they had a back pin on one, all like, and they were driving it way down there, and they could not get that ball to skip up the slope and get there onto the back pin. Yeah. So, like, that tells me that it probably it wasn't playing all that firm, and it probably doesn't play, like, a true, true links. But visually, yeah, I mean, for sure. I feel like at the beginning of the week, they also mentioned, like, it, you know, it's, it, it is. It's an American links style course. So, you know, and yeah. – it's just it's different turf right like yeah. it's plays softer like you said it, it visually looks like it but just like the way the ball reacts around there and things of that nature just isn't 
played on the ground. It's played in the air. So like I said, visually, I agree. It like, like I said, you show us that without, and like, tell me that's an ocean and don't tell me it's Lake Michigan. I probably think it's an Ireland too. Yeah. Yeah, I get that. Yeah. For and sure. I mean, is it, is it really necessary that they have what, over a thousand bunkers and literally probably 800 of them have never even seen a golf ball? It's like, <laughs> I mean, they might for amateurs, though. You know, you never know with where these, like, you know, how good these guys are. They make a lot of them not existent where you throw, you know, us four out there and we probably find another couple hundred of them that are out of play for the big, for the pros. <laughs> but no, Could it's be. fair, too. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, no, I mean, overall, great Ryder Cup, though. I was glad to, uh, glad that we whooped some ass and took some names. <laughs> yeah. Hell yeah. Mikey, what was your biggest takeaway? Yeah. I think when I kind of take a step back at the end of the week, what really jumps out to me is just truly the, the disconnect in overall talent that the U S team had compared to the Europeans. When I look at this singles results, you know, and we'll take Ian Poulter out of the mix because he's just a true, he's just a Ryder cup guy. And uh, you know, ability doesn't mean a whole lot for him. Um, you know, and he, he could beat anybody in the world when it comes to Ryder cup, but I look up and down here and, you know, Paul Casey played okay, but DJ just stuffed him all week. But <laughs> Weisberger, Locker. Weisberger, Hatton, Lee Westwood, Tommy Fleetwood, Matt Fitzpatrick. They are not better than the way they were playing this week. And I, I don't want to say forever, but like realistically, I don't think any of those guys are better than one person on the U.S. team. Yeah. So – I, I think it's it, it was going to be tough for them to win when you have the bottom five players in this entire thing, if not the bottom six or seven. Shane Lowry, you could probably put up put up there yeah. as being realistically of the twenty four people that showed up. You know, they probably had seventeen through twenty four, which is just a huge hill to climb. So that's kind of what struck me is just the how much from a pure talent standpoint, U.S. could put up there and write singles on Sunday. Xander, Cantley, Scotty Scheffler, Bryson DeChambeau, Morikawa, Dustin Johnson. Like, that's what we throw out. That's what we throw at him, the first six. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, come on. So, I mean, stud. Absolute fucking beat. I loved my favorite, one of my favorite probably moments of the weekend that really felt to me, I was like, okay, maybe I can take a breath here. Cause I was just the whole weekend. I was like, Medina, Medina, Medina. That's all it's going through my head. I'm like, I'm not, I'm not getting ahead of myself. I'm not doing, I'm not going to be that guy that is like, well, you guys fucking, you know, I'm not going to get caught. Right. Talking all that shit. And then the Euros do something stupid. But like when he made that putt on 15 or 16 on Saturday afternoon and was f- pumping his chest and chest bumping Bryson and like finally 15. showed some emotion. Right. Cause he was pretty stuck. I know he's playing with Bryson. So he's got a, He's got to calm down a little because Bryson's so off the fucking planet. He's got to kind of level him out a little bit. But when he made that, you know, 18, 20 foot or whatever it was for Birdie to win three holes in a row, take the one up lead going into 17 or whatever it was, and he turns back to Bryson, he pumps his chest and all that stuff. Like, I was like, fuck yeah, Scotty Scheffler. Like, let's go. Like, 2 0 and 1 as pretty much the 12th guy on the team based on points, right? Like, Harris English, you could argue, is probably the bottom guy based on, like, you know, talent and things of that nature. But based on the way they qualified, he was the low man on the team. And he went out there. He played Rom twice, and he never lost the match. I mean, he kicked his ass in singles, and they got a half in their first four-ball match with him and Bryson against Rom and Hatton. Like, to, to go out there and be the last guy picked against the number one guy, like, the guy for them that was kicking the shit out of everybody else he played – and to get a point and a half out of two matches against that guy, it's unbelievable. Like, that's that's why, it, like, shout out Eric, right? Like, we were singing from the rooftops. Like, Scotty Scheffler needs to be on this fucking team over Kevin Kisner and Kevin Na and all that shit. Like, he just fit the course better. It's an investment in the future. It's, like, made so much sense. And I'm so happy that he went out there and just, like, showed everybody that and, like, didn't make it a thing. You know, like, if he went out there and went, like – Oh, one and two or oh two and one or something like that and like kind of sucked you you know you'd have the people like well yeah the u.s won but like could have won even more if kevin kisner was, you know like you would have had that shit and i'm just so kisner over uh english still I, w- I wish we did take that pick i, I thought it harris english he's just not exciting 
Oh, he's not exciting, but he plays some damn. He played pretty. He played pretty left. good. I mean, yeah, but I I just love kids. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it was all around pretty exciting. I think one of the bigger things for me was, it, as like not surprising as it was, like DJ going five and zero in his like sixth go around at this or fifth go around at this maybe, and like when he was on top of the world two years ago, a grant different golf course, but like went one in four in Paris, like had a very mediocre year to his standards this year and then came out and just kicked the shit out of everybody. I think part of that is getting paired with Morikawa, who is also an absolute stud. But I think DJ just coming out and just, like, reasserting himself, really. Like, he kind of – I know he's number one in the world, like, not long ago. But coming back out and just being like, hey, by the way, like, I know you guys are talking about all the rookies and the young guys and Spieth's back in the mix and all this shit, but, like, don't forget about me. Like, I, I can still fucking come out here and do whatever the hell I want out here. And, I mean, he stole the show in the presser after. I mean, that was <laughs> unbelievable with the <laughs> – you could tell, like, it, like Brooks sitting behind him and stuff, like, as he's going through that presser. And he's like, absolutely to, like, the can you drink with these guys all night and all that shit. Brooks behind him is like, oh, boy, get somebody get the mic from this guy. Like, I can see where this is going. Like, he's fucked. <laughs> like, <laughs> you could just tell he's out there ripping tequila sodas. And I was listening to No Laying Up's recap, and Tron was saying that they are hanging up top of 18, like, looking down to the green where all the guys were up by the concessions. He said from when DJ finished his match till when the rest of them finished, he goes, he must have ran up and down the stairs to go to the concessions five times and getting, like, <laughs> you were on the rocks or vodka on the rocks he's like it was a very clear liquid in that cup like there's no bubbles in there <laughs> like and he was just going up and down the whole time so shout out dj he kind of shoved it because i think going into the week i was like a little skeptical of what we get out of him based on his past Ryder cup performance and not having the best form this year but my goodness he came out and kicked the shit out of everything. i think him and morikawa were like eight under in the foursomes one morning like just something absolutely ridiculous so that was some of my biggest stuff or, you know, one of my more exciting takeaways, I think, on a, on a positive note. But what did you guys have as, like, disappointments? I mean, you know, not we're obviously rooting against the Euros during the Ryder Cup, but there's a lot of guys on that team that, like, are super fun to watch and I root for on a week-to-week basis on the PGA Tour. But what did you guys have as your biggest, like, or even on the U.S. side, too? I mean, not everybody was undefeated, right? But, like, who are your biggest kind of disappointments on whether it was Euro or U.S. side this week at the Ryder Cup? Who wants to go first? I mean, I'd say the biggest letdown, like I said, I mean, as much as I'm happy we killed them, but, like, you do. You want to see some – I mean, at least me, like, I want to see something close. You know, I want to see some competition, and I want to win. I don't know if it's a letdown, but I guess Team Europe was a letdown, right? (laughs) Yeah, it's less dramatic on Sunday than – Like, it's not as fun to watch. I get that. That that would really be my only letdown, I guess. I mean – yeah, I mean, Rama on Sunday himself, he, he didn't even play that well, did he? I mean, Scotty birdied like six of the first seven, I think. Yeah. Five of the first six. So, a little bit of a buzzsaw there. And Rom has been fucking dragging everybody around that golf course for the first two days, <laughs> playing in all four sessions. So, probably a little bit of tired. And then Scotty came out firing, and it was probably like, oh, fucking Christ. Like, you know, like probably one of those situations. Um, but yeah, it, I, it was a little tough. Yeah. yeah. The other thing I, I have to say, I think Skittles, they need to go back for the green flavor, back to lime. Green apple doesn't do it. Doesn't do it. <laughs> just, just putting that out there. Besides the point, but that, that's probably the biggest hey, one I got right sneak, now. Speaking of candy, I ate a whole box of Mike and Ike's on Sunday. That's an underrated candy. That Mike, is and an underrated. Like Mike and Ike's, you like Mike and Ike's? your boyfriend at? <laughs> your boyfriend at they speak up on it those those like you never you never go out of way out of your way to get them but every once in a while they you somehow find yourself having a box of them laying around you're like hmm, this works i can do this yeah and they go to, they go down easy <laughs> yeah, yeah fuck, time. Man. i'm on the hunt but, uh, for my connection now <laughs> disappointment for me um i wish Outside of the golf course, I wish we would have saw a little more Daniel Berger's girlfriend. We didn't see a lot of Tori Slater this week. That was this. Dis- she got weird. That was di- that was disappointing. I don't know if they're going through something, but uh, I wish them the best because he just she just ups his game completely. Scotty like- Shepard's got a nice little snack on the side. <laughs> his wife, yeah, yeah, he does. 
I mean, hey. Yeah. <laughs> Daniel Berger, I mean, <laughs> try to take this off with the girlfriend talk for a second. Hit some really skanky irons down the stretch in both in a lot of his matches when when all of a sudden it was two twenty plus into some of like whether it was a par five on sixteen or that shot into seventeen, like real bad irons like so like he um Hosley ones <laughs> he I, I don't know what hole it is it's like maybe six or seven out there it's like right before it gets to the second par three mm-hmm. and it's a long hole and it's like 490 and they were hitting drives into the wind yeah. so it was only going like 280 out there and he had like 215 down the hill and it kind of looks like it almost kind of looks like the eighth or it almost kind of looks like nine or ten at pebble. at pebble yeah i know what you're talking um, about and he just like it didn't even have a chance of getting there it was like in a bunker 30 yards short right of that pin um and then also on that par three he he aimed that like 30 yards into the crowd and like toe cut that thing back onto the left edge (laughs) it was so bad like that gives me that gives me my god that like, gives, I was like, Did Pro Tracer missed that? Like, what is what is this fight yeah. going on? Honestly, that gives me hope that, like, I can play golf at a high level at some point because it doesn't need to be pretty. Like, nope. and he's just – he has found a shot that, like, even when he hits an absolutely horrendous shot, he makes a bogey at most, I guess. And, right, those guys just find Make it with the putter. Movies. And he's I, – I think he's honestly – a he's probably an underrated driver of the golf ball just because he never hits it left yeah. and he's just playing from the fairway all day long. And yep. when you hit irons like that, like the risk of a three iron in your hand is that you hit a, a snipe hook and it gets somewhere real bad. Yeah. And for him, even if he skanks it a little bit, it goes like two twenty five, and it's short right of the green and yeah. he figures it out. Like, I mean, and obviously from a talent perspective, he's nowhere on the talent spectrum that Rory McIlroy is, but like how many times have we seen Rory snap hook a long iron, yeah, like into the water and be dead. Yeah. Yeah. Like into like, in like into the middle of a pond, just <laughs> because it's just, it's possible from yeah. with the speed and his golf swing. So I just think he just plays in a, a place where as long as a burger, as long as his body still works and lets him turn, he's probably going to play golf at a high level for a long time. Yeah. Um, you know, it's kind of a quirky swing, but there's there's not a lot of variables in that golf swing. Yeah. Shout out Rory at whether it was the Honda or wherever on the floor swing from like five, six years ago where hooks one left and just boomerangs his four iron in the middle of the pond in the middle of the round. <laughs> I think that might have been at Bay Hill too at well, some point. Bay Hill, okay. I was new as somewhere yeah. in the floor to swing because they show it yeah. like every every year when that whatever tournament is comes up again, you'll see the highlight come out on Instagram or whatever. But shout yeah, out Rory I think. For that. I think at Bay Hill, he hit. He tried to hit the same shot three times. He hit two in the water, and then the third one landed like a foot on the green and almost went in for like a yeah. seven or an eight, and they hooked Boomerang. his. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, all right, so disappointment, Tory Slater, pushed that one off. Um, European, I mean, just the whole European team, I would say as a whole, I, I wish we would have got a little more a little more fight out of them. I just feel like they yeah. came out so slow at the first five, six holes all week long, like, it's yeah. just tough to, it's tough to battle back when you're down three or four. Like I, even some of those matches, like the U.S. would, they won the first three holes, they lose four, but like they're still up three or four at nine holes, and that's yeah. just that becomes debilitating, and like your captain can't save you from that. Right. And then I would say my my only disappoint, I I, Jordan Spieth, like, yeah, so well, I. The putter was icy it hurt, on Saturday. Yeah, it, 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 it hurts me to say, but I think Jordan Spieth this week kind of shows, kind of showed us what we're going to probably get from Jordan Spieth for the rest of his career, and that is absolutely exhilarating stuff and some unbelievable golf shots. But like, I just don't know if the consistency is there for him, you know, to come back and be a prolific player that he once was. Yeah. I think his his good is so good that he's going to be a top 25, 30 player in the world. Yep. But I just don't know if his consistency lets him be a top 10 player in the world. Like we all kind of hope he, you know, he was going to be back. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, like you look at the majors this year, right? Like 
he struck it as good as he ever has at Augusta and putted the worst. He was the worst in the field of like the top 70 guys or whoever made the cut in putting. And he came in like fifth, you know, like even at the open championship too, like he just didn't make enough putts to go out and win that when he hit it well enough, which has never been his problem. Right. It's always been the other way. So it's like, then like he putted so fucking ridiculous for that two and a half year stretch or whatever, however long it was from 14 through 15 and 16 and a little bit in 17, we won the open at wherever that was. But like, I, I agree. It's like for it's concerning when it's not, when it's the putter causing him issues because although I don't know, I mean, if you're going to be there all the time, all he's got to do is get that one week where the putter agrees with him and he's probably be all right. But like, I don't know how often yeah. he's going to pull off shots. It's just it's it's a tough spot. Yeah, and I don't I don't think he's not going to win. I yeah I think Jordan Spieth wins five or ten more times. Yeah, for sure. You know, I I don't you know I think he wins twenty times on the PGA Tour. It's just I I think when you watch him play for periods and you like there's just a stretch this year where I was surprised if he didn't shoot seventy like if he didn't shoot sixty three on on Thursday. Yep. Like I was just surprised if he wasn't in the leader and like the leader at the end of day one, because it was just that good. And the yeah. ball striking was that good. And we knew the putter would come around at some point. Um, so do I think he's going to win? Do I think he has a chance to win multiple times next year? Yeah. But I just don't see from a consistency standpoint, he's just not, I haven't seen like, a level of consistency that we've seen out of Xander or Patrick yeah, Cantley or even like, Bryce, like even Bryson, like Bryson brings it 75% of the time. Yeah. You know, he misses cuts occasionally, but that's going to happen when you swing it 130 yeah. miles per hour. <laughs> yeah. um, but I just, you know, I, I think from a consistency standpoint, there's still a lot to be desired. I hope you, you know, I, I hope I'm, I eat my words because I yeah. think Jordan Spieth is, a super awesome champion and he would be if I could, you know, I would love to see JT win the masters next year, but Jordan Spieth would be one a for me. Yeah. Um, I think those are two guys that I think are just like ready to um, kind of, you know, win that, win that tournament. And I know we're, we're far, we're very far from the masters right now, but now that the Ryder cup is over, that's kind of where my, my mind has shifted. Has to which is just, it's tough because we got to wait six plus months for that um, or whatever it is. But yeah, uh, yeah no, some disappointments this week, but a, a fun week overall. And if you don't like the Ryder Cup, then you just like don't like golf because yeah. the fans, the venue, the quality of golf that's being played is just as good as it gets. And mm -hmm. just, it's so jam packed. When you only have 24 people, playing and only 16 people on the golf course there is just like you just get to see the same faces you kind of you get a better feel for how the course plays because you've seen yeah. every hole out there yep. you know how to play you know dj's being a stud this week so like when he shows up like on your tv screen you expect him to stuff it there was yep. a stretch on thursday where he just hit every wedge to five feet and it's like <laughs> yeah it was god nice. damn but yeah no it was it was pretty awesome as for, I want to get your guys' take on pairings this week. Like, was there one or two that kind of threw you for a loop, you know, from either side that didn't make sense? Or, you know, maybe after all the success the U.S. had right out of the gates, like, you know, not putting DJ and Morikawa back out there together on, on Friday afternoon, something like that. Matt, what was kind of, you know, can you kind of pinpoint any of those that kind of threw you off a little bit? Yeah, I think, I mean – you know, in hindsight, I should have kept my mouth shut, but the Friday afternoon pairings, when they came out, I was a little surprised based on how well that first session went to then not send a single team bit right back out together. A lot of the players went back out, but he mixed everything up. So like, I think Jordan sat that first Friday afternoon, JT went with Cantlay, Xander went with DJ. And then you had the guys off the bench with Bryson and Scotty playing together, who I thought was awesome all week. Um, and then Harris and Tony. Also, before we get to in the pairings, Bryson is just so much more likable when he doesn't wear that stupid fucking hat. Like, put a normal hat on him. I'm rooting for him right out of the gates already. I actually didn't even realize that. Yeah, like, wow. When he doesn't have that stupid hat on, like, and because when he puts it on, you're immediately like, oh, this fucking guy. You know, like, 
no matter but, what, like that's your initial reaction, no matter what. Fontaine, but. he's the fucking needle, though. Oh yeah. Oh, hundred percent. That fucking. It is. It is. I mean, you can't even. You can't even question it now. He is the needle in pro golf. Absolutely. Just what it is. And I would just like. I think I'd enjoy him so much more if he just wore a normal fucking hat all the time. Like, I don't know. It, it, like I immediately would see him on TV screen. I was like, all right, I can get down with this. Just. But like when I normally watch a PJ Tour event, he's got the stupid hat on. I'm like. Oh, here we go again. You know, like it just like feeds into like the whole scientist thing. And it's just like, ugh. but I mean, let me get back to parents because we could talk about Bryson forever. But I think on that Friday afternoon, like mixing that up, I was like, wow, Xander and Cantley just kicked the shit out of Poulter and Rory, like throw them right back out. Like, why are you mixing them up? I mean, it worked out. Obviously, I think all those guys were just playing so well that, you know, you're kind of good to throw them wherever. But I don't know. I would have thought and maybe they're giving more cow that afternoon off because they weren't sure how his back was going to react to like that property. And, you know, he's been kind of nursing that the last month or so. So maybe it was just a little precautionary. You don't want to kind of get out, get like lose him after day one kind of deal. But that was really on the U S side. That was the only thing I really questioned on the European side. However, I just don't see a world where Hatton plays the same amount of times or more than Lowry and Fleetwood like I just from like a ball striking perspective I know Hatton made some birdies but like he would disappear like when he when he was paired up with Rom and they played Bryson and Scotty I think he birdied the three of the first six holes where those are like drivers and wedges so you can kind of fake it a little and then when that middle stretch of the golf course came around where the holes got a little longer they got a little tighter you know the par threes get in the mix where they're like longer shots in the greens and stuff he was in his pocket like he didn't finish and then when he went out with lowry the second day he played two holes in the first 11 that lowry actually needed him lowry made five birdies on the front so they were actually winning their match but not because of him you know and he actually had some good shots down the stretch and whatnot like he made that birdie on 18 when he was paired with rom to get a half out of that match versus losing it against scotty and bryson but like he either made a birdie it seemed like or was literally out and it's like when you're playing and foursomes or four ball or whatever like just put so much extra stress on your partners where like tommy fleetwood i know he didn't play great this week but it wasn't his ball striking like he was in every hole he just didn't make enough eight footers 12 footers seemed to miss a lot of those to be honest but like and like shane lowry after his performance uh friday afternoon or whenever it was when he's pumping his chest winning that match like i just feel like if you're team europe like you got you like hatton was just not the guy lee westwood and Matt Fitzpatrick can't be together after how bad they got their ass kicked day one. How, like how, I mean, how do we even put them out to begin with together? You got to that spread was- that around. You can't throw like, unless you're doing like the whole sacrificial lamb thing. Like, let me not, let me not have four B teams. Let me have th- like two A teams and a D team. But like after that didn't work day one, you can't throw them out again in the same, I don't know. Like they were, there's just some were, on the European side. I was they like, were getting it up and down from off the world to keep those two matches from being like, six and five yeah like they on the fourth hole i don't know if it was on friday or saturday but matt fitzpatrick got it up and down from like 60 yards out of a greenside bunker Mm -hmm. he played like a seven iron out of the greenside on like a 60 yard bunker shot yep like came to the back edge and then got it to like four feet and i was like and that was to make sure it didn't go to like three up through four like they were just oh it was a scramble fest out there I just did – like, it just didn't make sense. And, like, Rory didn't have it, so why are you putting him out there with Poulter? I mean, maybe you're looking for Poulter to fire him up. But, like, if Rory's not the A guy, right, like, or, like, you know, the dominant factor on your team, your second or third best guy, Poulter's, like, your one of your bottom three. You can't put them out together again, right? Like, and especially after how bad it was day one. Like, they didn't even get to 15. Like, you can't – you got to break it up when it gets that bad. I mean, you kind of got to stick to the plan. You can't overreact and things of that nature. But after day one concludes and you're down 6-2 and really the only thing that worked was John Rahm, like anything else you put out there kind of fell flat. Like you got to figure – like the margin of victory, it wasn't like every match made it to 18 and it could have gone either way. Like if it wasn't John Rahm, they were done by 16. Like not many matches made it past 16 in that first day. Like I feel like if you're Europe, you just – hindsight's always twenty twenty, right? But like – that bottom half, I know the the depth isn't there on that team, but you got to spread it around a little bit. You can't roll Westwood Fitzpatrick out Friday morning and sit Rory. Like, 
if you're going to come back, Rory's going to be a part of it. You, like, you, you know, you live and die by him, I think. And when, it, when your team is like this top heavy and clearly they died by him, he didn't play very well this week, but like, it's, it's, it's just a tough pill to swallow. If you're a European fan, you see Saturday morning singles come out or foursomes come out and Rory's on the bench and you're playing Fitzpatrick and Westwood who made like one birdie in their foursomes day the first day. It's like, I don't know. Yeah. And I just feel like, you know, on I, we, Weisberger didn't play terrible. Honestly, he came out and made some birdies on Friday mm-hmm. afternoon, kind of to start them off and gave them a little life. You know, they lost that match, but I guess he I was a little su- no, and I guess I was a little surprised that after Hovlin and Fleetwood come out and they tie that match on Friday after Friday afternoon, that Fleetwood's not playing on Saturday morning. Exactly. My thought was when I when I saw them kind of figure it out a little bit and play pretty solid, um, my thought initially was Hovlin and Fleetwood need to go out there and they need to play all day tomorrow together and figure something out like they can ball strike people to death those two guys yep. and then you got like i agree you gotta you gotta roll with rory McRae. i know he's not what he used to be but he is the heart and soul of that team like and i think he showed it in that interview you gotta put weisberger and rory out there on friday morning and and see if you know a rookie can light a fire under rory a little bit and find something all mm-hmm. we did was kind of kind of pull him down by playing with Holter and then struggling again on Friday afternoon. And yeah, I, I don't know. Rory has come out time and time again, the last three or four Ryder cups and said, he wants to play all five. Yeah. That's the, he's first, time that, he's right? That's the first time he's ever sat. was that Saturday morning session in his mm-hmm. whole Ryder cup career. It's like, if anybody's going to give you enough energy out there to turn around, like I know John Rahm's doing his thing out there, but it's, it's different if it's Rory out there freaking out, pumping his chest like that carries throughout the crowd john rom's gonna silent the crowd because he's a fucking killer out there but rory's gonna get like the crowd being like fuck you rory like all that shit like he's gonna be the one that like is a momentum fucking switch and i know he didn't have it this week doesn't mean he would have had it but like the only way you flip it after that ass whooping of day one and like is the only way you can flip that around is something like you need a lightning bolt right you need something to flip it like turn the tides flip it at the bottom whatever you want to call it like and you're, you're not there just nobody else on that roster that's going to provide that uh, he's the guy that ha- would have been your only way out and i mean granted he could also go out there and play like shit again but i think you have to you kind of live and die by that like that's that's the only chance you had to flip it if you go out there and just go like they did three and one again it's like okay <laughs> you know like even if they went two and two but like no energy or momentum to it it's like I don't think it really matters because then, like, you're just, like, we'll just get you in the afternoon. We'll be fine. Like, I don't know. That was the biggest thing for me. I was like, you got to, like, Lee Westwood and Matt Fitzpatrick, like, you got to split them up or did they don't get to go again, like, after how bad it was the first day. But uh, Lee Westwood just, like, I mean, he had an awesome start to this year and a really strong Euro season last year. But, like, he did not, like, he was not showing any form the last probably six months and like did not have any business out like he looked bad the whole day like uh, again shout out no laying up we shot them out all the time but like they were saying that the first day i think westwood and fitzpatrick on the first hole i don't know if they're the anchor match or third match out whatever but fitzpatrick like lee westwood tees off fitzpatrick hits one to like six feet right above the hole just kind of like a tickly one down the hill and one of the euro guys from sky sports is like kind of walking around with them and they goes oh fuck because he knew Lee Westwood had to make a six footer. And he's like, this is, here we go. Like, it's not, that's got no chance, you know? And like, if you're saying that on the first day, it's like, you can't, <laughs> we going to throw it out again. Like, it's like, I don't know. But Joe, you have any other pairings we didn't touch on? I know me and Mike just went on pretty long. There, yeah, but. no, you guys pretty much nailed it. I mean, I, I thought on USA, and I don't know if they've done it in the past, but I, I don't know. I thought like Brooks and Spieth was kind of a weird team. Yeah, that was a little weird. Yeah, I think. I- I didn't think that was necessarily a good pairing per se, but uh, yeah, that was like the only one that kind of struck me as, huh, interesting. Yeah. But I mean, right? If they, I, I forget what you know if they won or lost, but no, they they played Rom, so they lost. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Right. Rom and Sergio were three and zero together. Yeah. So I mean, like, right? If maybe if they played well, I wouldn't be saying that. But that was, yeah, that was one that I just kind of thought was a little, uh, I wouldn't have necessarily done, but. 
Brooks did play pretty good in that. Jordan just didn't make anything for him. Yeah. Like, I think I think that was a case of they Berger played like shit in the morning with Bryson. They're like Bryson's playing well. We want to get him another run. We got to sit like some guys that have been playing all three so far and just kind of fell out. Did I agree though? It was weird to see them two together. Yeah. That was definitely different, but. I would have, I mean, right? I mean, going back now, especially, I would have loved to see, him, and I think I said it last week, Brooks and Bryson together. And I mean, yeah. they said, like, it came down to it. They wanted to play together. And I mean, that's hey. awesome bold, to hear. Bold prediction Brooks Kepka, Kansas brother for Bryson DeChambeau at the Zurich Classic next year. <laughs> they might. I would, could, I mean, honestly, if, there's if like nothing around, to that event, but that would be a lot of fun. Yeah. I'm very curious to see what those two got, you know, going for, you know, what it's like going for it. I mean, you got to think it's just, it's done with at this point, right? Um, I think it was done with a long time ago, but yeah. all had nothing else to do but talk about it kind of thing. Yeah, but, you know, exactly, right? It's it's for sure done now unless something stupid happens. But, uh, yeah, 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 that's a lot. That, that's that. <laughs> yeah, I guess – um I don't know. I just think that, like, Mike, you kind of alluded to it, but, like, Rory's interview after, for everybody who didn't see it, like, Rory was in tears after yeah. he beat Xander on, in singles on Sunday. Um, Sky Sports interview was really, like, it's incredible. And Kyle Porter from CBS did a really good write-up of, like, just talking about the evolution of Rory and, like, what that means and, like, how we should all take a piece of that and stuff like that. I just found it, like, that's the best thing about the Ryder Cup, right, is, like, these guys, like, everybody's making money there, really, except for those guys, right? Like, you know, all the apparel companies, like, they're getting some shout-out with, you know, running with the USA gear, Euro gear. You know, the golf course itself is making money for hosting that kind of event and all the, you know, facilities and whatever else, like, all this merch tents and all that shit. Like, everything's making money except them. And, like, he said in his interviews, like, I don't really get upset about personal wins and losses. Like, I could give a shit. And it's, like, this is a guy who's, like, been the top of the mountain, right? Like, he's like been the guy for like the last 10 years, give or take granted, you know, there's been other guys that have kind of popped up here and there, but like, he's been, he's the one that hasn't really left the spotlight, especially from the Euro side. And it's like, he's like, this is like everything to me. Like he, you could tell he's like, fuck, like I'm not going to be playing with Pulse or Westwood or, you know, maybe, you know, Rose might not be able to come back. I know he probably should have been picked this year in hindsight, but like, you know, a few of those guys that it's like probably their last go around for some of those older guys on the Euro side, like that changing of the guard, like you could tell it meant a lot to him. And I just thought it was really cool to see, like, you don't see that out of a lot of guys, but Rory's one of the best at giving you some just genuine insight to his, you know, mindset. And like, that was just really cool to see him, like, because that's what we've kind of been asking for out of him, right? Is like, show us your care, right? Like, I mean, granted, this is a different event and stuff like that, but I just was like, wow, like, that's that's what the Ryder Cup's all about. Like that's why we watch it. That's why we get excited. That's why I watch TV for twenty hours this weekend. You know, watching the golf tournament. You know, like shit like that. Like to see that kind of reaction, how much the players care about it when they're not playing for a purse, right? Like, it was awesome. It was funny. So the reason why I was late, like, I, so I told you guys, I had a did a little play with the pros, a step aside scramble. I had sixteen ladies, so I played like two holes with each group. We were on the last hole and we were talking about the Ryder Cup and, you know, one of the ladies was like, you know, something that I don't like is, you know, how much we, you know, how much the fans would boo Team Europe. I'm like, why? I'm just like, you know, I'm like, screw them. I was like, I'm the same way. I'm just like, I think of this like Team USA is the Yankees and Team Europe's the Red Sox. Like, screw those guys. I don't want them to win. Like, I just, I thought it was funny. But, uh, yeah, I just, why, why would you ever root for Team Europe? I mean, yeah. Yeah. It's- it, it it's it's like that but at this like the same time you just get like you just appreciate the fact that they care that much about something like yeah. and honestly the fans like i didn't think it was that bad it was just like it was just boo yeah. it's not like they were saying like rude things like no exactly i agree it's like you know i'm obviously not rooting for him but then to see like how much they care like at, that's why at the end of the week like you shake hands and you can move on like it's like it's because they all like they put they all multiple people on both sides are like this is the best golf week of my career and like out of guys who have won majors before you know like things of that nature so it's just cool to see like how much it means to these guys and how fun it was like john rom who won the u.s open three months ago is like yeah no this is the best golf i've ever been a part of playing with sergio and like the spanish no, so and all that stuff like you know, all, yeah like that's so cool to see because like sergio was john rom 
15 years ago playing yeah. with Ola Thabo, right? And Ola Thabo was Sergio playing with Seve. And, like, the way that all just went down the line, like, that you could tell just meant so much to Rom to be able to come out and, like, do that. And it's just – it's it's special. It's just, like, you don't get that when they're playing in the fucking Honda Classic, right? Like, you know, like, like whatever it may be. But I just thought that was pretty cool. And John Rom also had a funny comment in the press. He's like, yeah, I just hope I can be a part of these in the future. And they all turned around and, like, yeah, dude, I think you'll be all right. Like, <laughs> I think you'll be on the team in 2023. Like, I think you're okay. Don't worry about it. <laughs> you know what I was thinking, though? Well, like, why didn't they – granted, I'm glad it happened this year, but it's like, why didn't – you know, the Ryder Cup didn't happen last year in 2020. Yet all the gear says 2020, but it's like, why didn't they just do the President's Cup as scheduled and, you know, just go to – you know, and then just do the right – you know what I mean? Just kind of keep that pattern going. I thought just, that was just kind of – And just skip it? Yeah, you know, and I mean, if anything, just push the venues back. So, like, in 2022, it's at – you know, um, whistling straights as it just right. No, that's not where it was. Yeah, it was. Yeah, 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 it was. Yeah, I'm losing my mind. Um, but exactly right. It's like, why didn't they just do that in 2022 and push your venues back and keep the years the way it is? But now it's all changed and everything like that. But whatever, it is what it is. Yeah, I, you know, I think I don't know. I'm sure there's contracts and stuff, and oh, yeah, there's yeah. a huge insurance policy out with all these venues and stuff too like if they didn't play that they're probably you know whistling straights probably gets a hundred million dollars or something like that so there's uh there's some big stuff going on on that there's so many different things but i think i also want to bring up quickly i know we've been chatting for a while so i want to be cognizant of time on that too but i am not hearing great things about the course in rome uh (laughs) So for our followers out there, there's a couple interesting articles. They had the Italian Open there. Um, and relatively harsh reviews on the first one. I'm trying to think where. What's it after, called? It's like uh, Marco. Something Simone, in Rome. Marco Simone or something. Where is, is it at Beth Page in 2025? Yeah, yeah we'll be there. And then, and, then, and then it's at Adair. Marcos Which, Simone, yep. Now, after playing Adair and kind of seeing, honestly, I think, you know, we talked a little bit too about Fontaine over the last handful of days, how maybe maybe we should be going to this neutral setup idea. Adair could be a very, very neutral setup. Mm-hmm. I think, you know, it, it's a cool area and it kind of, it's a very, it's very Irish and it's very European in the setting, but it doesn't really play in that perspective. That could be like a very, very neutral, yeah, difficult but playable golf course that produces birdies, but also just is a really cool setting and an epic setting. And I think at the end of the day, the Ryder Cup thrives on it being this like hyped up exhibition. Mm-hmm. So like, let's bring it to these like Properties. grandiose sites right like a dare that has a castle in the background or whistling straights that is just like a ridiculously epic Mm. location right there um you know and so i think there's these grandiose locations really could be pretty pretty cool of a venue like even if they bring a Ryder cup to like this new pga place in texas at some point which i'm sure Mm -hmm. is the the game plan that's like PGA compound. Like it's very much like sawgrasses. Like yeah. it's just kind of a really it's built for it. It's built it's for just, the, the the event, not the golf, right? Like yeah, and it's not a golf course, but like it's got the room to build these massive grandstands and wow. to set up the bowl around the first tee and like do all that shit that is like what adds to the Ryder Cup, right? You hear you're like the Ryder Cup brings out the energy on the first tee, the crowds like. You don't see that on the first tee at the the you know Rocket Mortgage, right? <laughs> like you need to have venues that play to, or at least have that as an option where you can build that kind of infrastructure out. Yeah, I I agree. I just think as much as the Ryder Cup is awesome to watch, the pictures and kind of all those little things that go with it that document the experience that it is are what make it great. You know, we're going to have some really cool pictures from this this week and some really cool videos of the settings and those par threes present like some really cool 
um, you know, little, little snippets of what the Ryder cup was. Um, but that really stuck out to me is like, maybe we need to just find some more neutral venues and just make them crazy scale and just hype up that everything that is the Ryder cup, because like, when I think of a dare, like they're going to put hundreds of thousands of people on that place and it's just going to be like the coolest experience of all time. Yeah. Um, I would do, I would do a lot to go back there for a Ryder cup. That place is nuts. pretty epic. Yeah. That, that was actually, it's a, it's a good little point there of like, you know, if you look back at the last three Ryder cups now, I think it was like 17, 11, 17 and a half, 10 and a half. And now 19, nine, like flip-flopping in there and in, in between it was us Euro us, like, probably got to like make that a like rule not just like oh it'll be nice if the venue works out like they might just have to bring in a third party to at least go through the setup of the course and things like that maybe just to make sure it doesn't go too extreme one way or the other i think no matter what course this week unless it's some ridiculous one like i don't know if that changes too much it might make the score a little closer but i think us like we've talked about throughout this it's like the talent gap was too big to overcome but they do have to do something to make it so to Joey's point you're making earlier, like you got to make Sunday more exciting past noon, right? Like, or I guess past the first couple hours, right? Like once the U S was making the turn and everybody was two or three up, you're like, all right, we're good. You know, like they'd have to flip every single one of these. And they're like, it's not like they're all one up or even, you know, like it got like, so out of hand that the last two hours, like I was just watching to try and find some, something funny with the celebration, right? Like, that's what I was hanging on for and watching for. Like, I knew we were going to win, you know? Like, so I'm hoping that they get, and I don't know how you enforce it or when you start it or how all that works, but they got to come in at some point and just kind of make a third party, you know, whatever you got to do. I don't know the exact logistics of how it's going to work, but you got to have other people come in there and set it up to make it as neutral as possible. Like you're saying, Mike, just to make it a little tighter, a little bit more like focused on the best team, not the best team that fits. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, I just think that's something they got to make sure they focus at um, or focus on going forward. But I don't know. You guys got anything else? Ryder cup and we've been going pretty good here, but I don't know. I love, like, I love the Ryder cup. I watched every second of it this weekend, like Friday. I did very little work. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> um <laughs> like i was watching it the whole day saturday same thing sunday all day like i loved every second of it like i'm screaming at the tv and every putt is as much of a blowout as it was i had fun at every second of it like i don't know i'm, I'm looking forward already to rome and it'll be interesting to see like what the team shape out to be um but I don't know, you guys have any other thoughts no that's it yeah. that was that was the, probably the golf most golf heavy we've ever been on this this podcast and it was it was a worthy topic, so yeah. uh, it was, rightfully it was nice so. We got about we got about three months. We're gonna have to uh, we're gonna be doing some deep dives, non golf talk in the next three months. With I don't really care about the fall series. I'm not gonna lie. I mean, if something spectacular happens, we'll talk about it. But probably gonna be focused on a lot more of the booze and travel and kind of the other side of bogey proof here as the PGA Tour winds down. Honestly, I think we got to get in the mix. Let's cocktails are great, but like let's get some some regionally inspired some some dinners some dishes out there like nope. they're down, they're down Mrs. another pimento cheese sandwich i'll do it <laughs> that's what i'm saying pimento cheese they're down in uh, mississippi this week joey i need you to go to the store and get some catfish and fry it up <laughs> and show the show the people how to do it joey's too busy eating <laughs> buffalo chicken omelets come on <laughs> bro you think i can cook fucking catfish you kidding me i don't even know how to cook no, i don't know i can't i'll tell you that Point taken, point taken. <laughs> <laughs> I'm aware yeah. that you might no, have definitely, we'll definitely be doing a deep dive, I think, on the Instagram. Like you said, expanding out of the cocktails into maybe, I will get a little food, a little travel, some more focus around there. And also, I'm going to be doing a deep dive in my golf game this winter and try and figure out what the hell I need to do to <laughs> save a few strokes. So I'll document that through the IG. But I think, you know, part of this podcast, we're going to talk about some other stuff, get back into some wine talk a little bit you know mikey i'm sure we're gonna have an episode where we pick your brain on your coaching experience now going from d3 player to d3 coach and see what that collegiate golf looks like on you know both sides of the uh of the of the golf clubs we'll call it i guess i don't know but i think there's i think there's a lot of different stuff that we can get into the next three months and you know that little little change of pace for the bogey proof staff here yeah 
Yeah, from from trigger from trigger man to uh to aim aimsman marksman. I don't know what you well, what do you call go. the person that tells you where to go. Yeah. I, I said that to my said that to one of my guys the other day. Um, we were talking through like a tee shot. And I was like, okay, like I this is what I think you guys should hit, but I'm not pulling the trigger, so like I can't make that decision for you. <laughs> and then it hits a shitty shot, and I was like, "Told you." <laughs> and it's simple shit. Like it was a, there's a three, there's a bunker out there, there's hazard out there, like three oh five. This kid murders the ball, and his miss is left. And there's a bunker out there, two forty five. All the room in the world to the right. It should be a three wood over that bunker, and I have a pitching wedge in, and he absolutely murks a drive. Pimp steps it and it goes in the hazard. Yeah. Course man. And I just, man. I just, I just walked off the tee. <laughs> That's why I hit nothing but three irons on my PAT. No driver whatsoever. We also got to chat about that too. Yeah. Yeah. The That's, process, that... right? And now that you've gotten that PAT, that is another like big milestone in your PGA career. Where are yeah. you with from a book standpoint? Level two. Okay. So I'm getting there. Hey, I, I was just... chat. I was chatting with my uh, uncle the other day. They're looking for a number two assistant at Great Horse if you need something. Yeah, yeah. Let's not. Yeah, no. I mean, I'm, I'm in. A, no, I'm just. I'm in a very good spot here, and it's. it's... I I would agree. You guys, you got a beautiful club, and uh, you know, you know if, you're getting, I mean... if you're getting to swing it with the ladies on Tuesday in September, it's tough yeah. to beat it. No. <laughs> and you know, I mean, there's, you know, I mean. The, the the head job and from what I think at least is mine within the next couple of years and you know there's already you know some members have kind of mentioned that they kind of want to try to groom me to become the next you know my next boss basically which you know he was a director of golf general manager for and head professional for all you know 20 years so yeah I, I'm I'm in a good situation here that's very tough to leave no, I like it. I honestly, I think if I was you, I'd be looking for some land up there by the lake. I'd be, I'd be building on a house. You're ready to go. Sooner or later. Sooner or later. Good mm-hmm. vibes up there. Good vibes. All right, boys. Well, plenty more to talk about on both of those topics as we go forward. And uh, looking forward to chatting next week. Cheers. USA. Cheers. See you, fellas.